everybody and welcome to a new episode of What the Field. I'm Emmeline and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Professor Martinez, and our co-founder and farmer, Gonzalo Urcolo. Thank you for inviting us, Emmeline. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. So today is actually a very special episode and we're going to do something that we usually never ever do, which is talk about health and diet. And why are we doing this today? Why are we really getting out of our comfort zone and talking about such a sensible um, and very specific topic? Well, because our special guest, Professor Martinez, has kindly agreed to talk to us. And it's not just any guest. By ducting and being the principal investigator of the PREDIMED study, which is actually one of the largest uh, studies conducted in Europe on health and nutrition. We thought, okay, this is actually the one and only opportunity we would have to talk a bit about the famous Mediterranean diet and olive oil. So uh, thank you again, Professor, for joining us. We really appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. Gonzalo, do you want to add anything? I know this yeah. is a topic I'm very passionate about. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming, Dr. Martinez. And I think it's important to explain why we don't usually talk about health in crowd farming is um, well we are we feel we are experts in farming and we feel we are experts in logistics so we don't like to talk about topics that we are not expert and healthy is a very important aspect that uh, if you want to talk about this in your farmer pages uh, you should have like professionals auditing your text and since we do don't have that and we don't see the necessity we always um, avoid to put things like this fruit is good for uh, the health because of this. But having a product like extra virgin olive oil and having the opportunity of inviting Dr. Martinez, I think is a unique opportunity to, to break our rules and talk about health. Yes, as we said, coordinator and lead investigator of the largest randomized trial in all of Europe on nutrition and health. We think that really warrants uh, this episode to be about yeah. health exceptionally. So Dr. Martinez or Professor Martinez, how about we start about talking about the Mediterranean diet as such? What, what does the term Mediterranean diet even mean? Well, the, the term Mediterranean diet does not belong to the current practices in Mediterranean countries such as Spain, Italy or Greece nowadays regarding food habits. It refers mainly to the overall food pattern consumed in the 50s and 60s of the past century in southern Europe, especially in Crete, in Greece, also in Spain and Italy and northern Africa. Uh, but uh, it was lost during the, the last uh, three decades because of the globalization. And the, we are importing uh, lifestyles and diets from the United States mainly. There is the junk food, the sodas, uh, all the burgers. Uh, I, won't, I, I won't say any uh, commercial brand, but <laughs> there is like a pattern that especially younger sectors of the population in Spain are following, and this is unfortunate. So uh, mainly it is a, a, a diet characterized by a large consumption of uh, uh, foods from vegetal origin, plant-based foods, but it is not a vegan or a vegetarian diet because uh, meat is allowed and also fish and eggs, but the, the main sources of calories are uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, cereals, especially whole grain cereals, and the main source of fat and uh, providing also a sizable amount of calories is olive oil, especially extra virgin olive oil. So extra virgin olive oil is like the, the flagship of the Mediterranean diet. You cannot speak of the Mediterranean diet without including uh, extra virgin olive oil. And also tree nuts are really uh, very important uh, because they, they are present uh, very often in the traditional Mediterranean diet. Uh, fish is uh, a good source of proteins and also of other interesting nutrients in the traditional Mediterranean diet. And also um, the, the, there is a, a good source of protein in uh, legumes, 
mm-hmm. legumes traditionally in Spain, but they, they are lost nowadays in the current Spanish practices, culinary practices. Uh, our grandmothers uh, used to prepare very good dishes of legumes, but so now lots of lentils, lots of lentils, chickpea, right? chickpeas, beans, and, uh, and also um, you can allow for eggs. There is no problem with eggs, hmm? and also when you go for meat, prefer poultry instead of red and processed meats. These are the main elements. And also, an important thing is a glass of wine with meals. Uh, <laughs> red so or white? Red, red. Preferentially red because red wine has more po- um, phenolic compounds that are definitely healthy. I, I will never recommend somebody who is an abstainer to start drinking. Or I will never recommend young people to drink alcohol. But for people older than, than 40, 45, uh, they, they have m- um, more uh, higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, myocardial infarction. There are hundreds of epidemiologic studies suggesting that moderate amounts of alcohol in the form of red wine, not as a psychoactive drug, but as part of the overall dietary pattern, they bring down the um, the rates of uh, ischemic heart disease and also ischemic stroke. They are um, the main causes of death in the world. So uh, I, I will recommend to maintain the consumption of red wine for people older than 40, 45 years, only during meals mm, and never as uh, binge drinking. You know what binge yep, drinking course, binge is? Binge anything is mm, usually yes. not good. So right? uh, we define binge drinking as drinking more than four drinks uh, in a row during two hours, three hours. This is definitely very, very harmful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it it is a a sensible topic, a a sensitive topic, sorry. May I ask, because you mentioned that meat, uh, at least poultry and fish, are also part of the Mediterranean diet. Is it possible to have a healthy Mediterranean diet and not eat any products that come from animals? Well, this is not a Mediterranean diet, if you do that. <laughs> so we, we need to be very careful in science when we use term. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in an Indo-Mediterranean diet, in a Japo-Mediterranean diet, uh, or in a vegetarian Mediterranean diet, or a dairy Mediterranean diet. This is not. When we rank the foods uh, according to adherence to the conformity to the Mediterranean diet, we usually give negative points to meats, and to dairy products. Hmm? Mm-hmm. So uh, this is the, the score uh, that is called the Mediterranean Dietary Score. It has nine points developed by my good friend Antonio Tricopolo in the University of Athens. So it is very, very frequently used in nutritional epidemiology. So we give negative points to uh, whole fat dairy. So cheese, cream, butter, and also to all sorts of meat. So uh, the issue here is not to eliminate, to completely avoid the consumption of meat, but to reduce the amount of meat. For example, we usually recommend people to have Sundays, at least one or two days in a week, not eating any meat. But meat, uh, especially poultry or fish, they are very good sources of uh, high quality protein. Also eggs are very good uh, sources of high quality protein. And you you can definitely avoid any nutritional deficiency if you follow the Mediterranean diet. So it is healthy, it is palatable, and it meets the requirements of nutritional adequacy. This is very important. Right. Does it consider the, med- the official definition of the Mediterranean diet? Does it consider that the consumption of this product should uh, be organic or not organic? Because when you tell us that uh, the definition of the Mediterranean diet, of the purest the Mediterranean diet, was the one that people were used to consume in in Greece, Italy, and Spain during the 50s and in the 60s, maybe during this year. Farmers were not using uh, so much pesticides that they are using nowadays. So maybe, do you think, is there a correlation between organic food or not? Well, uh, there, little by little, we are accruing evidence 
uh, but uh, about the, the harms of uh, uh, persisting organic pollutants and all these uh, residues from, from the, the pesticides. But the evidence is not so strong right. nowadays in regarding uh, the, the way that we assess evidence in the era of evidence-based medicine. Right. So, um, of course, there are many, many clues, many, many hints that th this is going to happen, but we need further research evidence. on this topic. It's a probably problem. hard to say yes, it is long term, right? Because y it's really hard to investigate yes, yes. because it's fairly recent phenomenon. I guess the same goes for, because you mentioned fish, for example, I've been reading articles saying um, that microplastics are being found in fish more and more and then transmit or go to the human body as well because they consume the fish. But I think this is probably also something um, that it's hard to investigate as of yet, no? To do a long-term yes, yes. trial, etc. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, what, what we need nowadays in medicine, in the era of evidence-based medicine, is not just the mechanistic basis. Hmm? So if you analyze the, the, the flesh of the fish, hmm, you, you can find some, for example, mercury or some persisting organic pollutants or so on. But uh, it is also uh, uh, an issue of the amount, of the amount, the mm -hmm. absorption. So at the end of the day, what you need is to look at people who are high, very high consumers of fish and what is going on with them after 10 years of follow-up of 10,000 of them. So this is very difficult to accomplish. Hmm? So th th that is the, the sort of investigation that we are doing. And up to this moment, we can say that the usual consumption of fish as it is today, uh, farm fish also, everything, it is healthy okay. because we don't see any harm with a high consumption of fish. Uh, in fact, we see benefits hmm, yeah. with a high consumption of fish. Fish is always uh, positively, beneficially scored in all the uh, items of the Mediterranean diet that we used. I have uh, been speaking about uh, the, the definition used by, uh, proposed by Antonia Tricopolo from zero to nine. We have also a definition in PREDIMED that is very, very frequently used nowadays. There is 14 points. And one of these points is to consume uh, at least three servings of fish a week. Mm -hmm. So th this gives you one point out of 14 points. Hmm? Right. So okay. if you don't do that, if you do, don't consume uh, three servings per week at least, you can don't get that point. Right. And we see that the higher the, the points, the lower the risk of total mortality, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, uh, diabetes, arrhythmias, so we have seen a lot of benefits with this 0 to 14 score. And in fact, yesterday I published in the, in the newspaper El País a, a, an article explaining that most of the Spanish population, Spanish population, the general Spanish population in a representative sample, they believe that they are very good followers of the Mediterranean diet. But when you objectively uh, assess them, a representative sample with this 0 to 14 points, the average score is only 6.3, 6.3. It is less than half. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of room for improvement regarding the Mediterranean diet. And the problem is that 81% of the Spanish population believe that they follow very closely the Mediterranean. That's actually what you're saying. I can totally confirm this from my everyday life, life experience. When I moved to Spain, I always had these discussions because being from Austria, people are always telling you, oh, you guys eat so unhealthy because you, you use butter instead of olive oil, et cetera, et cetera, and we are much healthier because we follow the Mediterranean diet. And then you would meet up with them, and as you said, where do you go, to some burger place or to eat some tapas, which are usually very fatty, uh, cheap meat, fried don't, don't in something. Touch, don't touch the tapas, please, <laughs> Emily. Don't touch the tapas. I'm like, what Mediterranean <laughs> diet? So the actually... Actually, yep. sorry, Gonzalo, to, for interrupting you, but you mentioned something that I thought was actually quite interesting, a very, very interesting notion that Gonzalo had the other day when we talked about the Mediterranean diet. Um, you were wondering but whether or not ethnic origin plays a role, and basically, I think your thought was, does it have any impact at all? If I'm, for example, from Austria, and my ancestors traditionally had a different type of diet, 
Am, am I is my body maybe less responsive to it than than is there someone any, like Gonzalo? Uh, uh, is there any evidence Spanish that your ancestors come from a Mediterranean country that the Mediterranean diet is better for you than some someone that their ancestors are not coming from this region? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so from a biological, a purely biological point of view. Because when uh, th there has been studies looking at the genetic background of people and uh, the importance of the genetic background regarding the effects of diet on health are tiny. They're very, very small. What really matters is the way of preparing foods. For example, we have done several studies in large American cohorts, the nurses' health study that has more than 100,000 nurses follow wow. up. They are volunteers. They provide every two years information since 1976 to nowadays about their diet and health every two years with updated information on diet. And we have studied there the effects of the Mediterranean diet, olive oil, and we have seen the same benefits that we observe in Spain, we have seen them in uh, the United States. Um, together with our colleagues uh, at Harvard School of Public Health, I have several of my team people, several people from my team working there, and uh, we, are, we are continually collaborating. So we, we split the sample into different categories according to the ancestry because we thought not because of any genetic reason or biological reason but we thought that people from mediterranean ancestry may be more likely to prepare foods in the traditional mediterranean way so it is a cultural sociological factor uh, and we see only small differences in fact hmm? sometimes they when they say uh, uh, they use olive oil for cooking. They use a lot of olive oil because when you say some, sometimes I have said uh, American people, please put olive oil in the salad. They just put just little, little drops. Bit, no? of They're scared oil. of the fat, probably. So no. when Ansel Keys, that was the, the the guy who who coined the term Mediterranean diet, he was from Minnesota and he came to the Mediterranean in the 50s and 60s of the past century. He he wrote. They put a vegetable literally streaming in olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> like so a for, soup of olive oil. For him, it yeah. was amazing to yeah. see such a high amount of olive oil. So it depends on the culinary practices. Mm -hmm. So now, now in nutritional epidemiology, a very interesting field of uh, research and also of health promotion is culinary medicine to teach people how to cook following the traditional Mediterranean practices of uh, healthy cooking. Let's talk a bit about olive oil yeah. um, and the Prediamed study. Something we were wondering whether you could explain from a medical point of view was whether there was an actual difference between extra virgin olive oil and regular olive oil. We, we, we were a little bit crazy when we designed the Prediamed because you need to, to, to think this was never done before. So uh, we randomized volunteers for five years. How many volunteers were there? 7,447. Wow. To eat not what they like, <laughs> but what we, they, what we told them to eat. Hmm? And they, uh, they were distributed at random. Hmm? So <laughs> at random, you <laughs> receive <laughs> 15 liters of extra virgin olive oil every three months. At random, you receive the advice not to consume any fat. Hmm? So cut fat a lot, cutting uh, a lot uh, your, your fat intake. And the other group was uh, to receiving uh, three nuts. Hmm? And the two groups with olive oil and three nuts receive intensive education in the traditional Mediterranean diet. And the other group received intensive education also on the low-fat diet that was the uh, standard diet recommended by the American Heart Association at those times for preventing cardiovascular disease. And y you know what I mean. I say, you're not going what you like. Hmm? <laughs> you're, you're not going to eat what you like. You're going to eat what I tell you. In breakfast, lunch, uh, dinner, every day for uh, five years. I can imagine you did some in exceptions during the birthdays or, or weddings, no? <laughs> so th that was part of the education, how to, swi to, to switch 
to uh, the consumption um, better in line with the intended diet. So we, we got a lot of compliance. And we observe uh, a 30 percent relative reduction in the risk of uh, a composite endpoint of myocardial infarction, uh, a stroke, and cardiovascular death in the two groups with the Mediterranean diet in comparison with the standard paradigm. 30 percent. 30 percent less risk of this uh, combination of uh, uh, hard clinical endpoints. So we needed to uh, stop the trial for ethical reasons, according to an external committee that w were our advisors to ensure the safety of participants, because you cannot any longer go on. Go on. Yeah, uh, once, once you see that the evidence is so strong, yes. you need to stop. Then go on with the low-fat <laughs> diet, yeah. because in the, in the two Mediterranean gr groups, we were giving them a lot of fat in the form of olive oil and tree nuts and mm -hmm. fatty fish. Hmm? A very naive question, maybe on my part, who has no idea about uh, about medical trials and studies. I am assuming that the people who were selected to participate uh, were screened beforehand to see if they had previous cardiovascular diseases yes, yes, or yes. maybe hereditary issues or anything. No. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We 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 need to pass a very stringent mm -hmm. uh, ethical uh, committee and an institutional advisory board. Uh, and all the requirements of informed consent, uh, screening, none of them had previous cardiovascular disease, but they were at high risk because they have high levels of cholesterol or diabetes or hypertension. All of them? Well, either they needed to have either three major cardiovascular risk factors or type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's even more significant than yes. the result. Okay. What is happening? I mean, once you have this evidence and you have shown from a medical perspective this evidence to, to I don't know, to public governments, what are they doing with these numbers? I mean, I well, for, for me, sometimes the, the decisions of the politicians are, <laughs> are surprising <Yeah. laughs> because, you know, now they are going to put this uh, front of pack labeling of the, of the packaged foods and they are putting, uh, you can have A, B, C, D, E. This is a proposal. Fortunately, it is already uh, stopped until they, they reach the decision, they make the decision. But the issue is that they wanted to put C to olive oil hmm? uh, instead of putting A with the best evidence. Hmm? Yeah. This is nonsense. Hmm? I have said this, I have written about this, many of my colleagues have written. And in addition, a very important issue in uh, medicine in medical research is to have an independent replication of your findings. Unfortunately, last month of May, just one month ago, Lancet published a very similar trial to PREDIMED. Instead of 7,000, they had only 1,000, but all of them had a previous myocardial infarction. They did it in Cordoba. They have two arms instead of three, instead of the three arms that we have, low fat, uh, nuts, and olive oil, they have only low fat and Mediterranean diet plus olive oil. And they found a 27% relative reduction after seven years of intervention with a very, very similar, almost identical protocol for the intervention than the PREDIMED. So we were very happy to see an independent Same results replicating our results. This is very important in science. You need to have independent replication of your findings. So we, would, we, would, we were saying was found for another group. By, by another group. So uh, this is important. And also, in addition to the reduction in cardiovascular disease, we found a 40% reduction in the risk of diabetes among those who were not diabetics at, the, at baseline. And also among women, we found more than 60% relative reduction in the risk of breast cancer wow. in the group of olive oil. That's so the, let's put the numbers in place again. 60% uh, reduction in breast cancer for women, 60, 6 0. 60%. Wow, this yes. is 6 0. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, like not 16, 60. 60. 60. Yes. I mean, it's, it's wow. No? Yes. Uh, 30% reductions in cardiovascular disease. disease. And the, no the other number is? 40% reduction in diabetes. Type okay. 2, right? Type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. so with the Mediterranean diet. With the Mediterranean diet. Compared with low fat diet. And what is the low fat diet? Well, the, the, the low-fat diet is to reduce all sources of fat in the diet. 
So including to, extra to virgin olive oil. Including extra virgin olive oil, tree nuts, uh, fatty fish, and also, of course, uh, uh, fatty meats uh, right. are, are, and also uh, whole fat dairy, butter, cream, margarine, uh, avocados, for example, they are very fatty. All the sources of fat, because that was the usual advice that uh, medical doctors were giving to their patients in the beginning of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. That was the recommendation, the official recommendation. It was called a step one diet with uh, you, you need to you need to meet less than 30 percent of your calories coming from any source of fat. And that was included in all the dietary guidelines all over the world and the ministries of health. Everybody was recommending less than 30 percent of calories coming from fat. That was a step one. And a step two was less than 20% of calories coming from fat, all sources of fat together. PREDIMED has changed this. Hmm? And not only PREDIMED, other studies. We have seen, for example, in the nurses' health study, this large cohort and another similar cohort called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study in the United States that olive oil reduces total mortality and also reduces cardiovascular disease very strongly. So this is very consistent because we used two independent cohorts and we found the same. Uh, this was uh, the, the leader of this uh, paper was uh, Marta Wash Ferre, who was working with PreMed and she moved to Harvard. She has been there for seven years now. And Harvard University in the Harvard States. Harvard University in the States. And, and also we, we are seeing something similar here in Spain in a, in a case control study conducted by Marina Poyan in the, in the National uh, Center for Epidemiology with a case control studies, uh, another design in epidemiology, uh, especially for extra virgin olive oil, a reduction in breast cancer. And now we are conducting other trials. We have uh, ongoing trials for preventing relapses of depression. It's called PREDIDEP one of my collaborators, Almudena Sanchez Villegas. She's the leader. We are conducting another trial for prevention of relapses of breast cancer. Stefania Toledo, she is the leader. Very similar to PREDIMED, but for women who already had a previous breast cancer. And a PREDIMAR for prevention of arrhythmias, conducted by Miguel Ruiz Canela, who is another of my, my co-workers. So we are developing new trials to try to replicate the findings. Uh, what is your motivation behind, I mean, uh, what is your motivation of uh, running these studies of PREDIMED? What is your main motivation? Well, uh, after I was a skeptical, you know, I was a skeptical about all these issues. I, 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 I thought yes, it was just talking and talking because, you know, people in Spain were nostalgic of the of the diet of their <laughs> grandparents. They, and so they still on. are. They still until are. until I sta uh, started to collect data. So the first study that I did in Pamplona was a comparison, uh, like what we call a case control study. We compare all the cases of myocardial infarction occurring during three years in Pamplona with controls, and I found a strong, a very strong reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction associated with the Mediterranean diet and with olive oil. So I thought, all these guidelines telling people to reduce the amount of fat, this is nonsense. Hmm? With a lot of fat coming from natural sources of fat, vegetable sources of fat like nuts and olive oil and the traditional Mediterranean diet, you can do a lot. Formerly, I was working in cardiology. My, my first medical specialty after finishing, I was uh, for some time a cardiologist. So I thought it is very important to prevent the main cause of death in the world. Hmm? So if I am now a specialist in preventive medicine, what, what is the best thing that I can do? So to try to correct, to help, to contribute, to correct uh, a misconception, because there was a misconception regarding what is the best diet. And you know, some things, for example, uh, of course, uh, cannabis does a lot of harm, hmm? definitely. Smoking does a lot of harm. But people are not every day uh, consuming cannabis uh, continually. Hmm? So you need to eat every day several times. Mm -hmm. Yes or no, you are going 
<laughs> yes or yes. <laughs> you, at the end of the day, you will have to eat something. So the selection of the foods is a, a key issue for your future health. So uh, for me, this is a strong motivation. Well, the, the, the deeper motivation, the deepest, sorry, the deepest motivation for somebody working in public health is uh, social justice. You need to think, well, well, what can I do to help people? This yeah. is the reason why I'm working. I, I don't receive any money from the olive uh, oil industry. I don't receive any money from it's any It's going to be the, the next question. <laughs> who, who, is, who financed the pre so, study? Uh, we, we are working very hard in order to get uh, public funding of all our studies. So the okay. PREDIMED was funded by the National uh, Institutes of Health in Spain, the Carlos Tercero, the Institute of Salud Carlos Tercero. I was the coordinator from 2006 to 2013 of a network of investigators. Previously, Ramon Stuck was the coordinator. We receive approximately half a million euros from the Spanish government every year to, to hire the dietitians and the nurses. And, and we ask it for and free. And to buy 50 liters of no, extra that, virgin that, that oil. That is what I'm going to. We were asking uh, producers of olive oil. Right. To, uh, to give us the olive oil for free for our volunteers. Yes. Without having any participation in the design or the results of the trial, we never informed them of any of the things ongoing. So, uh, and we did the same with the producers of tree nuts. Gonzalo, was your olive oil also donated? <laughs> 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 or not yet? You're gonna do it no, maybe no, for no, the next no, trial. Not yet, but w w I am an olive grower and mm -hmm. So, so we, we, we received the one. olive oil from the Patrimonio Comunal Olivarero. Okay. Yeah, and we continue receiving it in another trial called PREDIMED Plus. Okay. We, we have almost 7,000 participants in this new trial. We add to the major end diet now physical activity, goals for weight loss and reduction in calories right. to, to, uh, as, as a way to fight against obesity and metabolic syndrome. And we don't have the results yet. Right. So I hope yeah. that in I two years. I encourage you to, to also to differentiate um, what you give uh, is organic or not. So I can be the organic uh, <laughs> provider. To do an extra <laughs> trial, organic olive oil receivers and yes, non organic olive oil. That would be ever interesting. That would be for interesting for us, especially. Interesting. And also varieties. And also even the time you harvest the olive. Yes, yes. This because is very important. And if it's you have early, press, early harvest, yeah. Then you have the polyphenols, because I can imagine that the polyphenols needs to do with all the yes, founds. Yes, yes. In PREDIMED, we have published more than 300 papers, scientific papers, peer-reviewed, and some of them are very mechanistic, looking specifically at the effects of the phenolic compounds. Usually everybody says polyphenols, okay. but for example, oleocanthal, that is very important, is not a polyphenol. It is just a phenolic compound because it has a single uh, phenolic ring. So uh, we have seen that the higher the amount of polyphenols or phenolic compounds in urine, the lower the levels of the inflammatory markers. So uh, of course, the timing of harvest is very important. You have higher peaks of oleocanthal in olive oil if it is prematurely harvested. Exactly. Th th um, this is very important to explain to the people is if you prematurely harvest, then you get better quality, but you have less quantity. Okay, yes. if you harvest so later, you have more quantity of, of product, but the quality is not the same. And we talk technically about the quality. One of the main differentiators are the polyphenols and phenols, as you were saying. Yes, and, and also the, um, the shelf time of the olive oil, because mm -hmm. hmm, once that you buy it, if you take a long time to consume it, hmm, yep. the, the, they are decaying, they are yeah, going the down. The product. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Only compounds, uh, has all, uh, they, they have a lot to do with the timing of the of the Even bottle. the bottle, because yes. if the bottle is transparent and the sunlight mm. goes inside, yes. then they last for They are volatile less. compounds. Volatile. So we could say that the olive oil, in a, in a way, degrades? Yes, with time. With yeah. time. Yes, yes, yes. So this is also the problem. I'm guessing if you buy it from, for example, the supermarket, you don't know 
the shelf life the product has had. It might have well, been you, there you usually for a while, find no? in the bottle or in the tetra brick. So we need to uh, check date, the date. You know? Yeah. Uh, preferential consumption before that. And date. if it was uh, harvested early or not, usually it's also indicated. They are not no? obliged to put when what it was it was it harvested. But since the early harvest oil tends to be a little more expensive, a little more, a bit more premium, I think. Um, they yeah, but you can put premium olive oil without, without harvesting. Without explaining. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's important. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, is sometimes the the if you are not selling your extra virgin olive oil with your brand, you don't really pay attention to these details. No, I mm. mean, okay, I'm going to sell to the cooperative, and then the cooperative is going to mix with other f other farmers, so they are going to mix the olive oil. So I think the motivation of harvesting your olives earlier in order to have a better quality of uh, uh, product is just if you are able to sell with your brand directly to end consumers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's uh, an important point that's missing for me a little bit um, is the information of how much olive oil was consumed in your studies yes. because yes. I'm assuming we talked earlier that the binge uh, consumption of anything <laughs> is not good. Is this, is it an exception for the olive oil? Did you control the daily intake and maybe yes. also the timing of the intake? Because we recommend it to use uh, in the 14 points mm -hmm. of the Mediterranean diet that we used in, uh, in PREDIMED. Uh, we recommended the first point was to use olive oil for all culinary practices. So for cooking. For cooking, salad. for salads mm -hmm. as a spread in the, in the bread for for frying for frying this is important the best olive uh, the best oil for frying is extra virgin olive oil why why is when you go through the internet i know sorry for saying that but doctor going through the internet is not a good <laughs> a good <laughs> a uh, practice sword. but why there are in other cultures uh, they are saying that uh, olive oil is not good or they are not used to cook with olive oil because they believe that for frying is not good yeah that it shouldn't yes, be because heated. the smoke Point, yes, no? yes, yes, yes. This is this is a myth. Even. This is a mistake. So uh, I don't know the origin of the of the mistake, but uh, all the, the professionals, all something. the scientists working here, uh, we all agree that uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil is uh, the best oil for frying, because usually you don't get 180 degrees. Uh, it is also protected against os oxidation because it, it, con it contains a lot of antioxidants. And in fact, I was in the board of a doctoral thesis in the University of Cordoba. And uh, this was a doctoral thesis of a food technologist. And they were reusing a lot of uh, fats and oils for frying. And afterwards, they were looking at the inflammatory biomarkers in the blood of people who consume the foods, frying with reusing these oils. And the best one was extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, empirical evidence that this is a myth. Sometimes uh, it can be caused the myth because of um, uh, expensive uh, prices for uh, yeah. so yeah. for frying and you can find something cheaper but this is not help this is economy in these 14 points uh, a score was to consume at least four tablespoons of olive oil this amounts to about 45 50 grams per day so very Including seldom what you use for cooking for everything okay, in summing total. up all the uses of olive oil, you will much. have okay. about 45 to 50 grams per day. When we gave one liter per week, uh, we were thinking in all the family, not only the volunteer in the mm -hmm. predicament. So uh, I have published several books with the uh, aim of uh, uh, reaching out all mm -hmm. the general population about these 14 points. The first book was Predimed date el gusto de comer sano. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, so enjoy healthy eating with Predimed. So in that book, uh, together with the first dietitian, Ana Sanchez Tainta, who was working in Predimed, and the first nurse, uh, Beatriz San Julian, we uh, wrote one by one a detailed explanation of what were the 14 points of the Mediterranean diet and how to comply with them 
also including recipes for cooking, mm -hmm. is okay. that the Mediterranean diet is highly sustainable by the population because they enjoy it a lot. Mm. So it is not a, a torture diet. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not torturing people. So this is the reason why we succeeded in PREDIMED because otherwise, if you introduce a low-fat diet, uh, it can have several uh, interesting properties, but people do not keep it in the long term. And also for diets for losing weight, we are now in PREDIMED Plus using an energy reduced Mediterranean diet, and we see that the weight loss I is maintained three, four years without any regaining weight. Huh? This is unique because it is, it is tasty, it is very tasty. So this is an advantage of the Mediterranean diet. Amazing. Okay, um, just to quickly go back, one last question about the frying or using olive oil for cooking. So could you um, maybe tell us whether or not olive oil loses its properties? Is it, is it better for you if you consume it raw, uncooked? Yes. Well, I think that uh, definitely it is better raw because some of the properties are, are lost with, uh, with heating the olive oil. Uh, so we recommend it in one of these 14 points to consume two servings a day of vegetables and one of them as a salad adequately dressed with a lot of extra virgin olive oil. So this is the way of consuming. Uh, and also for breakfast, our usual recommendation is dark bread, whole grain bread, a toast with extra virgin olive oil. This is the usual main uh, course in, in the breakfast. Gonzalo's favorite breakfast, no? The yeah. The bread with the olive oil and the tomato, very classical Spanish one. Yeah, when I, when I in my, in, uh, at, at my home, we always have breakfast, extra virgin olive oil. And now, with sometimes with avocado inside. And when I'm, when I'm not with my wife, I put garlic. Mm. Because with, when I am with my wife, she doesn't like garlic too much. <laughs> so I, I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any favorite way of consuming your olive oil? Well, uh, I love salads, so uh, I, w I, I like to be very creative. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So in designing salads, sometimes you can put oranges, uh, granadas, uh, you yeah. can put uh, strawberries in salads. You can put a lot of things uh, in salad. Uh, blue cheese, a little bit of blue yeah, cheese, anchovies, uh, for example, yesterday night. It uh, was a splendid salad with a, 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 a small feta cheese that is very typical from Greece, and also uh, walnuts, and also anchovies, and of course the, the greens, and a lot of extra virgin olive oil. So I love this way of incorporating hmm? the, the nuts yes. and the fish, everything into one e salad. Everything every in one salad. So you, you can try a lot of possibilities for salads, not only tomato, lettuce, uh, I even olive discovered oil. as a, that it works even for desserts because I discovered in Spain yep. through um, my suegra, as we call, as I call her, the, the mother of my partner, that you can actually make a cake my, all my life, I thought butter was the only way of making cake, and I discovered here that with Gonzalo's oil, for example, it's very easy to make a very nice fluffy cake. So even yes, for yes. sweets, you can use it. And even uh, orange orange slices with olive oil on top, it's a dessert here. I was very imp like impressed by mm, yeah. the healthier dessert options also olive oil gives you, right? Yes, yes, yes. of okay. course. Um, is sugar... Um, an element of any kind in the Mediterranean diet? Maybe, I don't know, substituted by honey or something? No, I, I think that we have a severe problem with sugar. Human, uh, humankind has tripled the consumption of sugar in the last 50 years, and this has gone in parallel with the epidemic of obesity. So it's an so American influence, no, the sugar? This is an American influence, and it, it is especially dangerous for kids, for young people, because they develop a, a, a sweet uh, tooth, hmm? so they they don't like at the end of the day uh, vegetables, fruits. They want something sweeter and sweeter. So I think that uh, that we we need to be very careful with uh, adding sugar. I am meaning the the crystal sugar, the uh, not the natural sugars present in fruits or in in dates or in. in uh, and raisins and so on. So uh, you can perfectly consume raisins. They have a lot of sugar, but it is natural sugar in the matrix of the food. Hmm? 
Mm-hmm. What and about honey? Important. Well, a honey has a lot of sugar, definitely. Okay. So you you can use honey, but uh, in small amounts. Huh? Okay. Is, the, is, is honey one of the ingredients of the Medica- Mediterranean no, diet? No, we have received a lot of uh, pressure <laughs> from <laughs> external to sources to from introduce the versus honey <laughs> in our scores, and we have never introduced honey. I, it has a lot of sugar, definitely. Right. So uh, formerly in ancient times, in order to get honey, you need to combat to fight uh, the bees. So <laughs> it was not yeah, so easy yeah, to yeah, have yeah. such a huge amount of honey that is now available. So I think that it is uh, a vehicle for, for consuming, again, a lot of sugar. Being accustomed yeah. to eating too sweet. What would you say um, is the influence of nutrition overall uh, in mortality or for mortality rates? Do you think it, it is a major reason? It's impressive. It is impressive. It is dramatic. Yeah. Hmm? Dramatic. Okay. So you 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 m- can predict. Uh, I, I I I love to to do epidemiology studies. I spend a good time when I am analyzing data and preparing tables and report. I enjoy my work. <laughs> like this so, podcast. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I but especially when I ha- I started in nineteen ninety nine. So uh, it was. 23 years ago, a cohort study called SUN, the SUN study. It sounds very well in English. The mm-hmm. SUN study, Seguimiento Universidad de Navarra. Right. So I have 23,000 volunteers informing us every two years of their health and their their food habits and all the medical procedures that they undergo. So we have full of information there. So you have in a database like uh, 23,000 rows and you have more than 5,000 columns. Hmm? So you have more than 100 million data there. When you go deeper into this data, you discover what are the predictors of mortality, early mortality, what are the predictors of longevity? It is not very complicated. Smoking, uh, the, the, the effect of smoking is overwhelming. When you see that, you see what, what a, a stupid thing we have done, uh, smoking in uh, humanity. How, how, how were we so silly as to, do th- to acquire this habit? Because it is overwhelming. Then sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle uh, has a lot of impact. Pandemic hasn't helped then that obesity, much. Obesity. Yeah, is a strong determinant uh, of uh, cancer, early mortality. And uh, then the um, uh, the unhealthy diets hmm? that is correlated so. with the at least with obesity and with the yes. uh, sedentary life. No? But regardless of that, right? If you even if you are lean, if you are slim, uh, you will have higher mortality if you don't follow a high quality dietary pattern. And so the importance regarding mortality, incidence of cancer, incidence of cardiovascular disease, incidence of diabetes, quality of life. So all these things are highly determined by these factors. Uh, a sedentary lifestyle, obesity, uh, yeah. bad diet, and smoking, these are the most powerful predictors. Uh, the, the other predictor is age, of course, but yeah. you cannot modify age. But the other four predictors are easily modifiable. Let me introduce one aspect that is probably not very, um, very medical point of view, but I think friendship, having a good friendships, is good for your health. And if you follow Mediterranean diet, you will m- more likely have better friends. That's <laughs> because true. The social, I think, the psychological. I mean, if you're the, the social there's aspect, a link, yeah, right, between your your mental and your physical. You well, cannot invite friends. Yes, you cannot yes. invite friends I for a low been. dietary. No, uh, no, no, no. I mean, you are right you are right (laughs) Gonzalo you are very very much right because mm, I have mentioned the four uh, main elements but we have developed indexes not only of the Mediterranean diet but also of the med life the Mediterranean lifestyle and we include to spend at least one hour a day with friends Hmm? and uh, sleeping a short siesta (laughs) <laughs> Less than half the, an hour. the secret of Spanish yes, health yes, lifestyle. Yes, yes. <laughs> so all these uh, habits that are yeah. lifestyle habits also add a little bit to yeah. the healthy lifestyle. It's interesting to see it's not how much money you have in the bank. 
one of the reasons, no? So it's, it's very interesting to, to see that. Well, with the money that you have in the bank, uh, differences are real when you are comparing very low wages, yeah. very low wages. If you go for from very, very low to low, you experience bank when you are in the middle hmm, zone and you go up, you don't experience any advantage. Yeah. So uh, it is not to become richer and richer. You be, you become then uh, more healthy, uh, healthy, I mean healthier. I mean, the money gives you accessibility longevity. also because the problem is, I think, although they're working on this at least in Europe, is that the cheap thing to buy in the supermarket is a bag of chips or sweets yes. or whatever. And then if you go for organic vegetables, uh, non-processed food, let's say. In some cases, olive oil, it's, it's, it's just amazing more expensive. Why processed fruit has the same tax than healthy yes, food? Yes. No? It's, it's amazing I, I, with I, these I, numbers. Uh, another book that I, that I recently wrote in 2020, I published it with Planeta in 2020, is called Que Comes? What Do You Eat? Huh? And then uh, and there I, I include a chapter on the ultra-processed foods. They are Which the would worst. be what, for example? Could you give some example of ultra-processed foods? Ultra-processed foods are all those foods where you cannot distinguish the real uh, food. You only distinguish a product, and you don't know, you cannot know what is the, uh, the food. For yeah. example, uh, the nuggets, or, mm -hmm, nuggets, yeah. or uh, the sausages, mm -hmm, and so on. Mm -hmm. So... Um, they have a lot of additives hmm? and they are filling the uh, the shelves of the supermarkets so we including ultra processed foods the milkshakes hmm? with uh, flavors and additives um the distilled uh, uh, liquors hmm? yeah. the, the, uh, because they are not just processed they are ultra processed so you they mean like additive. whiskey and gin whiskey and gin things? vodka all these okay. are ultra processed uh, french fries are ultra processed they Obviously all fast food, uh, no? uh, all these pseudo french fries they say once you pop you, you cannot stop <laughs> so <laughs> you, you know what they are you are very elegant are meaning. By <laughs> so uh, you don't know what they are using because sometimes they use the worst uh, prime matter to produce this hmm? the things that th th they, they, they needed to get rid of hmm? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they recycle then they put additives hmm? these uh, fish sticks for example this mm -hmm. is not fish this is the, the things that you cannot you cannot sell in uh, their, their true appearance hmm? mm -hmm. you need to transform them to make them palatable to get to give them with additives and chemical and physical procedures a long shelf life. So they are all advantages for the food uh, industry because the prime matter is very cheap. Uh, it, they are highly palatable. You can sell them very cheap. So you, you have a margin despite sell selling. They are not very perishable, so they last so for a long they, time. They, they last freeze. a long time. So and they are very convenient because people can store them for a long time in their homes. So uh, I have always defended that if you put taxes on sodas and junk food, you need to use the government need to use those taxes to reduce the prices of the foods that are, have health. been demonstrated according to evidence-based medicine to be very healthy. Mm -hmm. Because be otherwise, definitely. you will increase the gap in health between the richer and, and the, the poorer poor. sectors of the population. Right. So this is unfair. Hmm? Mm -hmm. unfair. But, but sometimes my suspicion, and I want to be very clear about that, my suspicion is that this is an excuse to put taxes to sodas and to junk food. It is a new excuse to, um, to put more taxes and to uh, have further incomes for the government hmm? mm -hmm. with this excuse of health. They are not interested in health. They yeah. are interested in, in collecting more money and yeah. nothing else for the government for the <laughs> for their purpose. Yeah we need we need to make big changes now. Yes, I mean yes. we need we need politicians that are brave enough to, to make these big yes. changes that in the short term they, they probably they are going bad because they, they will have detractors but 
we need. Okay. So we never system. we never talk about uh, politics, health, and now we never talk about politics, and now we are talking about, about things, both so. in one. Yeah. So on that note, thank you again so much for coming. It has been amazing. Yes, really you're amazing. such a wealth of information. I think we both uh, tremendously enjoyed this episode. Yeah, pro Professor Martinez, I, I personally I, I have to say thank you so much, not just for attending to this postcard and translating like very difficult. A knowledge that you have into a simple conversation it has been amazing we have understand everything very good and and thank you what what you are doing for especially for the olive farmers too but not only farmers but and for the, the population as also. a whole yes let's sure. make a promise here <laughs> why don't we help professor martinez translate this one of these books into german sure Okay. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. <laughs> let's put hands here <laughs> and let's do it. Okay. So, so Professor <laughs> Martinez, you can count on us. Thank you. To okay. get your information out into the world so that the Germans know it as well. So thank you also to our audience for being with us for another episode. We hope you enjoyed this little field trip into the world of the Mediterranean diet and olive oil. And until next time. <laughs>